Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we'll be taking a look at Silverstone's dual tower cooler. This is the Hydrogon D120 ARGB. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so today's video we're we'll taking a look at a new dual tower cooler from the good people over at Silverstone. I should say straight away, this was sent to us free of charge for review purposes. So obviously, yeah, do take some of the things I say with a very small pinch of salt, but I will try and report things as accurately as possible to give you the idea whether or not this is going to be suitable for your next build. Now, the first thing we should get out of the way is the price of this, which for a lot of coolers these days, it comes down to actually what the price is, then you can look at performance and things after and see if it actually fits in with the rest of your build or your theme. This one at the moment retails, the cheapest I could find it here in the United Kingdom, was around about £45 from watercooling.co.uk. I'll put some links in the video description, both for them and other things like Amazon Affiliates, which obviously helps the channel, etc. Also, I'll put the link to Silverstone's site so you can check out the specs and details there in more detail should you wish to. But hopefully we should cover pretty much all of that in this video. So starting off with the packaging, as you can see, this is a... Actually quite a nice packaging setup here. I quite like this Silverstone packaging generally is tending to go on the kind of less is more side of things and they've certainly done pretty well here. So it basically says what it is on the tin. Hydrogon D120 ARGB. I'm not entirely sure why they've come up with that particular name. Hydro generally means water. And there's no water in this whatsoever. There's not even water in the heat pipes. So I'm not too sure if they're trying to kind of give people the impression that this is in some way is water cooled, but it definitely isn't. So we should state that straight away. As you can see as well, we've got the six heat pipes on there. So you've got six, six mil heat pipes on here. And also we've got massive support for addressable RGB with that five volt three pin setup. So that's suitable for ASRock boards, ASUS boards, MSI boards, Gigabyte, and also BioStore, and basically any other components or setups, hubs, etc., which use that five volt three pin setup. On the side of the box, it goes into more detail about some of the individual specifications. So we've got a really nice offset heatsink design here. So this is gonna give you extremely good RAM clearance, which is always something which is a little bit more of a inconvenience when you're looking at some of these dual tower setups. Quite often you will have to consider your RAM Whereas with this, because it completely offsets it, you can pretty much have any RAM you want on there regardless of the height and also using up all four slots if you've got a four slot board. Obviously that is AMD wise. It does also include two addressable RGB fans, both of which have eight addressable RGB LEDs on each one of those, so 60 in total. You've got a large nickel plated oxidization free heat plate on the bottom there, so really nice smooth surface. And obviously you've got those six six mil heat pipes. On the other side of the box, it goes into some of the technical details. So I'll put those on the screen large for you now and it gives you some of the dimensions. Effectively, this entire cooler from top to bottom is 153 mil. So not only is it offset, so it's gonna be great for RAM, it's also actually pretty small in terms of height. So you should be able to fit this in pretty much most ATX or micro ATX enclosures and probably actually some ITX ones as well. But do measure your case before you buy it. Also on the box handily is a QR code, which you can scan there and that'll give you the user manual. Although the user manual is pretty basic, so we should take a look at that next. So when we open up the box, first of all, is our installation manual. And actually this is a very simple cooler to install, at least for those of us on the AMD side of things. There's a really nice mounting mechanism. We are gonna do a full installation of this in a separate video. So if you wanna see how easy it is to install on an AMD platform, then don't forget to click on the subscribe button and the channel icon you'll be notified of future video releases, etc., etc. Or if you just search for this on the channel, you should find it. We'll also do an Intel one as well, a little bit later on as well, so you can see how that works. Also, I was gonna put it in the main video, but I figured this could be quite a long one anyway with some testing. So if you wanna see the actual installations, there'll be two separate videos for that. Next up in the box is the installation equipment. So let's take a quick look at this. So you've got essentially two main components. So you've got the Intel setup in this bag. So that's all your Intel fittings and this will fit everything up to LGA 1200. At present, there isn't an option for LGA 1700. That may well be something which they release at a later date, but certainly isn't at the time of recording. This will fit pretty much most Intel sockets, 775, 11.5X, and also obviously 1200, etc., etc. And is the usual kind of mounting bracket. So you've got the square, there's some clips, and also the push-through pins, etc., etc. Again, you'll see that in full detail in the installation video. When it comes over to the AMD side, things are considerably more simplified. So literally, there are two brackets. So we are taking use of the standard AMD backplate, which is excellent news. That is a very good thing to actually use. 
You've got a couple of spacers on there, a couple of screws, and that is essentially it. Very, very straightforward and easy to install. You also get a tube of thermal paste, which is always nice to see. And also there is a installation screwdriver. Now the reason for this is because this is extremely easy to install. You don't need to even take the fans off the frame if you don't want to. You can literally just put the screwdriver down through the middle of the cooler stack itself and do up two screws. That is all it takes, just two screws. So very similar in terms of the kind of noctua style mounting mechanism here, which is gonna aid installation greatly. And last but not least is the cooler itself. So as you can see, this is a twin tower cooler and also a twin fan cooler. This is a really nice setup. I do like it a lot. The fans themselves are relatively low noise as well, coming in around about 31 dBA under full load, which is uh, yeah, normally very quiet. We'll do some testing on that a little bit later and see what they're actually like. The fan blades themselves, you've got a nine blade design. The hub itself in the middle has got the addressable RGB LEDs, so those are gonna diffuse nicely towards that outer area. You've also got rubberized pads in all the four corners. Excellent thing on this, well, a couple of excellent things on this actually. The mounting mechanism for the fans themselves is a clip, but it's not a particularly fiddly one. All you need to do is basically pull the clip down and this ridge is actually holding the clip in place all the way through. So it's connected right from the top to the bottom, unlike some of the ones which we had with, I think it was the Arctic freezer, where you've essentially got clips that are kind of loose inside there so they can get lost inside that channel. But as you can see, if you move it, the whole thing moves up and down. This also gives you the option of actually sliding the fan up and down a little bit as well. So you've got a little bit of vertical adjustment there, which is a really nice thing to see. And again, for taking it apart, it's nice and easy to do. Literally just flip those clips off, pull the fan out, and then you can get in there to clean all of the actual fins on the heatsink. Something you will notice as well, the heatsink actually is slightly smaller on the front due to design where you've got the kind of uh, swoop back heat pipes there. Obviously there is something which has to give, and that unfortunately is some of the cooling tower fins themselves. So we've got around about 44 on the back and about 36 on the front or 38 on the front. So there is slightly less cooling efficiency on this front heatsink, but I think it's a really good trade off. Obviously when it comes to actually installation, you've got so much clearance there for RAM. I'll try and get you some B-roll shots of that. So after I've installed it, you can see what it's actually like. This should make installation extremely easy. When it comes down to the bottom, we've got our six heat pipes. All of this is nickel plated and copper underneath, so that's excellent. And you've got a really nicely finished base plate there, solid base plate, so that's gonna give you decent coverage on pretty much every IHS, which is always nice to see. Very smooth finish as well, almost mirror-like in fact. And at the bottom there, you can see the two mounting screws, which you gain access to from the top. So there's indentation there and there, and literally all you do is with your screwdriver, just aim down through, and that is where you can tighten or loosen the screws for either installation or removal. So very nice, very straightforward. When it comes to wiring, there is actually quite a lot of wiring on here, which is uh, possibly beneficial, but also possibly a little bit of a pain in the backside for cable management. But all of the cables are actually pass-throughs as well. So if you're a little bit concerned that you've maybe only got one CPU header on your motherboard, it's not a problem because you do have a kind of daisy chain effect here. So four pin PWM, with a spur so you can plug in both fans into one header. Or if you want to, you could just use two individual headers and have a little bit more granular control over the fans. And the same goes for the addressable RGB. You've got your traditional three pin, five volt addressable RGB. And again, that has got a pass through. So you've got a female plug and also you've got a male plug which has a cap on it. So you, again, you can daisy chain those as much as you like and add or remove other RGB effects from the system. So overall, very nice design. Fans themselves, I'm not sure if I mentioned it already, but the fan speed on these uh, up to around about 1850 RPM, plus or minus 10% due to margin of error, etc., and air speed, all that kind of usual stuff. But overall, actually very nice cooler. And again, for the price, around about 45 pounds, which we found it for here in the UK, it puts it into some pretty decent competition. The market for dual tower coolers is quite expensive. You do look at things, you've got things like some of the Noctua coolers as well, obviously the D15, which is considerably bigger. That comes in at sort of around the 100 pounds mark. There are other versions, slightly smaller, which will come in a little bit less, around about the 50, 60 pounds mark. I think for 45 pounds, if this performs as well as it looks, I think it'll do really well. My only downside, I think, for some people, would be the nickel finish and the, uh, the heat sink being in that kind of aluminium or just bare finish. I think a lot of people would have preferred to have seen that in a more blacked out, maybe um, like a satin matte black finish. I think that would look particularly nice, especially in more modern systems. But anyway, 
Let's get it installed, see what it's like, do some thermal testing, and then we'll come back with my final findings. Okay, so we're back and I've done some testing. You've probably seen some B-roll or maybe you're seeing it right now. I'm actually really surprised. This little cooler has done a fantastic job. Now, I have compared it with a previous test we've done very recently, which is with the Thermaltake Tough Air 310 and also the Nacho NHU12S. Must add the S on the end, very important. So essentially exactly the same principle. So we're using a Ryzen 9 3900. We're also using it with precision boost overclocking enabled and pretty much everything set as stock on our ASUS X570 Tough Gaming board. The fan curves, I've actually set custom curves, although for testing purposes, I used the 100% fans. So all the fans in the PC are 100% and that was the same for all three coolers. The ambient temperature is a little bit lower. We're looking round about one degree lower. Now, because of the way that our temperature probe or monitor in the house actually works, it doesn't go down less than one degree. So kind of margin of error there. So although it looks like we've had um, a reasonably significant win with the Silverstone cooler, obviously the temperature accuracy isn't 100%, but still it is giving us a very good indication of how it has actually performed. Now, a couple of things I should touch on before we go into the stats and look at the figures. Ease of use very very easy to use the am4 mounting kit is exceptionally easy to use there is a full video on that which uh, you can probably click on up here or down in the video description if you want to see how easy it is to install but essentially it's extremely easy using the standard uh, back plate using the screws yeah it's a very simple and straightforward thing to do and actually the screwdriver was very very useful i thought this screwdriver looked uh relatively pathetic if i'm completely honest with you but it's done very well and I actually used it to remove the Nocturne cooler which was in there as well and it did help with that so it isn't just one of those kind of one trick ponies where you can only use it on one certain cooler you can use this pretty much as possibly even your main screwdriver for taking apart your PC if you really wanted to but yes insulation was very good actually taking the cooler off and then examining the thermal paste we did use Arctix MX5 thermal compound in these tests and actually the spread was extremely good it was a very very nice spread very even consistency and actually it was so even when I took it out, it actually took out the CPU with it because I didn't get it quite warm enough to let it separate. So the actual contact between the CPU and also the heat sink or the heat plate on the bottom of the cooler was exceptionally good. It was stuck like glue, it really did. So that means you've got a very good and very constant pressure across the whole thing. Hence why it pulled it out with it. Other things to note, the RGB effects look very, very nice. The actual LEDs, they're diffused really well. The blades actually have got a really nice kind of uh, diffuser to them, so that you don't see the individual LEDs, you just see this nice spread of lighting. And actually from the footage, you'll probably see it in conjunction with the Corsair SP120 RGB Pro fans that we're using, which are obviously quite expensive fans. And I would say between them, I arguably would say the Silverstone actually looks slightly nicer. Okay, let us know what you think about that in the comments section below. But let's take a look now at the actual thermal performances. So looking first of all at Cinebench, uh, scores there, you can see these are the previous scores from both the Noctua and the Thermaltake, and also from now the Silverstone, the D120. And actually, even though there is a very slim difference between the scores, it was a win for the Silverstone, so that is excellent news. Again, it could come down to the actual temperature in the room being just ever so slightly cooler, although saying that, for most people, I think you'll probably agree that room temperature when it's only one or two degrees difference, it doesn't have that huge bearing on the processor when you're running those all core loads. So I would say definitely thermal performance appears to be very good. And again, compared with Noctua's NHU12S, which is a really good cooler, it's done very, very well. Noise wise, almost identical. I didn't notice any real difference, although I did make one slight adjustment. It does seem that one of the fans was slightly higher than the other. And for some reason on 100% load, it was creating a very, very minor whistling noise, which just moving the fan down slightly relieved that straight away. So again, yeah, that is likely to be entirely user error. So noise levels, especially in idle and normal use, I would say there's virtually no difference whatsoever. Nothing that I could detect. At 100%, all three of the coolers were essentially pretty much all the same. So that speaks volumes for Silverstone's technology in those fans. Looking at the temperatures, now again, there was about a one degree difference in the room temperature because it was done on different days, but again, it's gonna be in with that margin of error. But temperature-wise, I think, again, it's done exceptionally well at those idle conditions. 
we did manage to get down to the lowest temperature recorded was 36.4 degrees C. So that is again, a little bit lower than the Noctua and the thermal take. So if there was roughly about one degree difference, if you add on for argument's sake, one degree, maybe even two degrees, even then it still does essentially work exactly the same as the Noctua and very close indeed to that thermal take as well, which was a little bit higher. So definitely in terms of idle speeds, it is gonna be cooler, but idle speeds aren't what it's all about. What we are more concerned with is what the temperatures are like at full load. So again, fans 100% and Cinebench R23 running for approximately 10 minutes on each loop. And we're looking at a high score temperature of 65.4 degrees C, which again, the Noctua actually topped out at 65.8 and the thermal take at 68.5. So if you take into account that one degree difference, I would say arguably it puts the Silverstone pretty much slap bang in between the two. So Noctua did have a very slight thermal edge, but it was very slight. And again, it's down to kind of like one, maybe two degrees difference at best. But obviously temperatures aren't everything. They are important, but they're not everything. Some of it has to be reliant on cost. And when we take into example the costing of this, if you're looking at the Noctua NHU12S, you're looking somewhere in the region about the 60 pounds mark, whereas this costs somewhere in the region about 45 pounds. And obviously the thermal take is a little bit cheaper again. So as you move up through those price bands, obviously you are getting a little bit better performance, but for this to actually be slap bang in between the two, and also price wise to be slap bang in between the two, I would say if you're looking at a kind of performance per dollar or performance per pound, I think this actually is fantastic value for money. So that's gonna pretty much wrap this one up. Hopefully you've enjoyed the content. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this cooler. It's the first time that I've seen a cooler from Silverstone and I've got to be honest with you, I'm very impressed with it. If they can get them uh, into more shops and at a very similar price, around about the 45 pounds mark, I think they've got a real winner on their hands. And the fact that it's got that excellent RAM clearance, so you can easily access all four slots of RAM on pretty much any motherboard, I think that is definitely another win. So let me know what you think in the comments section below. But in the meantime, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.